So my name is Patty, and I know most of you here amazingly, but a few of you I don't know. So hello, I'm Patty, and this is my home temple. And uh, I'm sorry that I was late. <laughs> I was taking my time next door thinking I had lots of time, and I didn't want to sit in front of you for 10 minutes just looking. <laughs> and I came in, and I was 10 minutes late or something terrible, and people still stayed, which is really great. Um so um, before I give my talk, I just wanted to mention that um, I, before I came here, I, my daughter just drove all the way here from San Diego uh, from one in the morning until arriving with three little kids at nine this morning. And then I said, Natasha, I have to go give a talk. <laughs> and so... Um, you can imagine how that made her feel like, and but it's real reality check, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, I'm a mom and a grandmother and all these lots of, lots of things actually. And, uh, I'm trying to integrate it into my regular householder life. And I'm not successful this morning, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that my granddaughter said, be funny, Oma, be funny. And I'm like, oh, I just, and what she means is I'm very playful with them, but I couldn't be funny. I had to come here. I couldn't be funny, but I just keep them in my prayers as I do this, that when I get there, they'll, they'll have had a nap and be ready to be, for me to be funny. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, um, those that know me know that I'm not a scholar, but I consider myself a student and I'm hopeful that the fact that I'm not a scholar might help some of you other non-scholars feel mm -hmm. like you can do it too. That'd make it all worth it. So we just did prayers together, and I thought um, it might be helpful to just really briefly explain. I've written all this out, by the way, which is really typical of me when I feel a little unsure, but um, so bear with me. So I, uh, we say those prayers, they're a meditation, actually. So sometimes when um, we're kind of like I, for me, for example, I was, was Catholic, and I was just wanting to run far away from things like prayers or ritual and things like that. That's how I grew up. And I got here and what do you know, ritual and prayers, <laughs> you know, and I thought, oh, why? Oh, it's, oh, no, at first, at least, and bowing, prostrations, all these sorts of things. But I've come to uh, find that they're very, they are a prayer, actually, they are a meditation. I was going to say they're a meditation. And um, each of those prayers, actually, when taken on its own, could be a talk, you could give a talk on any one of them, actually, and maybe some of us will. And um, so the one prayer that I thought I would like to mention is because one that I say every day, a, a few times a day, is taking refuge. And I like this metaphor of refuge. It's like sunlight because the sun's warm rays shine down not only on me, but on everyone. And that's what refuge is like. The sunlight does not discriminate. Its warm rays give you courage and strength because you know that it shines on everyone, you know you're included. So refuge is considered an entrance to the Buddhist path. So this morning, I'm going to give a short talk. I was going to give a talk on bodhicitta. That's my go-to because it's something I'm familiar with. And I even wrote something. I had to do this all kind of quickly within one week, only to this is my pattern. I write something only to find that's not it. So, and I even made a poster about myself, which he said, I look depressed. What? <laughs> Anyone that knows me knows that I kind of look that way quite often. But um, so <laughs> I showed him another picture. And he said, that would look, look depressed. I showed him a third one. That would look depressed. I'm like, really? I don't know the corners of my mouth coming upturned a little. No. And so then... I was either going to cry or laugh, and I laughed, and he took a picture, and that's the one that was in the radar. So um, today, he asked me to give a talk on some, you know, our, our talks are often, or maybe all the time, every time, about something we would like to learn about or that our teacher thinks we should learn about. And so this talk is about what's called the four seals. Some of you here know about them better than I do. So it'll just be a refresher for you. And the, some of you are like me, don't know them very deeply. So then maybe you can get something from what I'm about to share. So um, a number of years ago, I mean, long ago, maybe five years, 
five years starts to sound not so long ago when you get to be my age, but maybe five years ago, I was given the task of memorizing these four seals. And I memorized one and I was like, oh, like maybe I can, maybe I could remember one thing. And then I memorized two. And then I forgot the first one. And then I memorized three. And then I forgot all of them. Uh, and I remembered one. But then after a while, I memorized all four. But then five years later, I forgot them all. But you know what? When you remember, remember when you learn something, you can relearn it more easily than if you'd never learned it at all. So for today's purposes, I have re-remembered them. And, um, but you know, when you memorize a text or a list or something like that, that doesn't mean you understand. It just means you've managed to memorize something, which is a good start. So the, there's different versions of the four seals, but the one that I learned is this. All composite phenomena are impermanent. All contaminated phenomena are suffering. All phenomena are selfless and empty and nirvana is peace. So the source for my talk today, I had to weave together a few and borrow from people, which I think is okay to do actually, because, uh, you know, I think that actually I give myself credit for that because I know people, <laughs> I don't know, might not know them personally, but I read from, I have a teacher. I read the writings of other um, masters. And so I want to share their words. I think that will be helpful. I hope at least. So for this talk, um, I have a few words from my teacher, Lama Jimpa, from Darshan, and then um, from His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and then from uh, a famous uh, Nyingma teacher that's all over the internet named Norbu Kensei Rinpoche, and then another teacher, um, Kempo Sultram Lodro. In our tradition, we just give credit, and that's what I'm doing here right now. Another teacher um, that's one of uh, Lama Jimpa's former teachers or current teacher, it's, several, it's always the same. Their teacher is the teacher, the teacher for always. Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. And Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche had a student that some of you are familiar with because she's written all these books and uh, the way she writes is really, uh, really speaks to people, a Western nun named Pima, Ch Pima Chodron. And then uh, an author that I like that used to scare me a lot, Stephen King. And and then also me. <laughs> so, um, so I, that's kind of a repeat, but I'll just go ahead and read it anyway. It's not that much. So the morning I told Rinpoche, that's what I call Lama Jimpa, that I would volunteer to give a talk today because our 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 teacher that was going to give the talk had to, he could not. He's he's making a big a big journey to Mongolia soon, and he couldn't come today. That's Kenshin Rinpoche. So I volunteered and I requested to give the talk, like I mentioned, on bodhicitta, the wish for those that don't know is the wish to awaken for the benefit of all beings without exception. And so he wanted me to give this talk that I'm going to give on the four seals because he, not just me, he wants everybody that's, con he considers him their teacher to have a stretch. And he said, most people want a homily or a story that offers comfort. And, um, and love. And I thought, of course, that's what I want. <laughs> and But he said, but with today's talk, he wanted me to have a different focus because we need more than that. And we should respect people and give them the real thing. So he gave this example to distinguish the value of a homily and the value of a more scholarly talk. He said, and he said this to some of you here, I'm sure have heard him say this. He said it so many times, but he said, if someone were to ask you, how do I get to San Francisco? And you answer them with, well, this is me. You'll enjoy the ride. It's so beautiful there. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is, he's kind of getting me with this one. Or it's beautiful scenery along the way and things like that. He said, that would be not very helpful because how are they going to get there? <laughs> you know, and then he said, oh, or, or this was, I feel like he's quoting me. This is very, very unsettling. And then he said, or you could tell them, you should stop every once in a while and stretch. But that wouldn't be helpful either. <laughs> but if you travel with me, you'll have an adventure because you might not get there, but it'll be fun trying. So, <laughs> so then um, he said, it's not practical, which is also very, very much me. But he said, you know, all, all kidding aside, for example, if somebody asks you how to get to San Francisco, you need to tell them to take I-80. And you need to tell them it'll be stop and go. And that's the truth. 
So the four seals are like taking I-80. Their message is literal in a way, direct, universal. The first seal that I, I read it to you already, and I'm sure all of you have memorized, <laughs> All composite phenomena are impermanent. And we often put this truth out of our minds. But what if, what if we put it in the forefront of our day? What if we ask, what would you do if you were going to die tomorrow? What would you, who would you call? And what would you say? And how would you live this day? And I remember, I tell this one pretty often because my mom was so close to me. I'm so lucky for the mom I had. Imperfect. Beautiful, perfect, imperfect mom. So when my mom was dying, everything slowed down. And if any of you have been with someone who's dying, you'll understand what I'm talking about. A simple cup of tea, sunlight in the window, hushed voices, medicines on a table, siblings arguing, sometimes people crying and running out of the room. And then one day my mom didn't talk anymore. But my mom loved television. She liked to watch crime shows. And people said, you should turn that off. And I'm like, I know, I'd hate crime shows. <laughs> but she liked them, and so I kept it on. And I held her hand. And that was a powerful teaching for me. Because I, for some reason, I thought my mom was going to live forever. At least I treated her that way. So that's my mom's first teaching about impermanence for me personally. So now I'm going to uh, talk about a teacher that is a very amazing teacher in Tibet. And I, I, I don't, I'm sorry that I may pronounce his name incorrectly, which I don't like, but I'll try my best. Kempo Sultram Lodro. He's one of the most important teachers living in Tibet. And his center is called the Rungar, and, or it's also known as the Center for the Five Traditional Sciences and Higher Buddhist Studies, situated in the Sichuan province of China. And uh, I'm going to just refer to him as Kempo. Kempo says the practice, this is referring to the first seal, all composite things are impermanent, is to rehearse thinking about change daily so that we become more tuned to the fragility of life, to give our lives clear purpose and urgency. We too could die tomorrow. So how would you want to live today? Are the things we chase after and the ways we spend our time truly the most meaningful? What's the most valuable thing that we could be doing right now? All people are born and every one of us will die. And the people you encounter every day, each of them is a hero. Kimpo asks us to think about how each of them was born from a mother and through her extraordinary care and exertion. And I just want to stop here because sometimes mothers are so difficult. You know, our relationship with them is so difficult, but nonetheless, they gave birth to us and and they did their best, which might not be really measured. Maybe it isn't exactly what we need, but at the same time, sometimes the very things that we don't get push us to go towards something greater than we ever could imagine. So our mothers give birth to in pain and treasure their child more than anything else in the whole world. And each of us will eventually die surrounded by loved ones, family and friends, or maybe alone, perhaps at peace, perhaps agitated and with many regrets. Kempo says, try to imagine this moment when you encounter people. It's especially helpful when you are arguing with someone because it puts everything in perspective. Picture them on their deathbed after a long life or after one cut short too fast, after a life of virtue or a life of vice, a life ending with friends or all alone. Each of our lives is an incredible story. Try and see this in the people you encounter or on the internet or on TV, the extraordinary arc of their life, where they came from, where they're going, where they are right now on their journey from cradle to grave. And each of them came into life without a name and they left their name and body behind. Yet we see the people around us as unchanging. We see them firmly as friends or firmly as enemies, firmly as helpers or firmly as obstacles. These solid unchanging views of the people around us are inaccurate. Even at this very moment, the people around us are constantly changing, constantly at influx, just as our own body and mind are in flux. So now I'm going to uh, refer to another teacher, Norbu, uh, 
Kensu Norbu Rim Rinpoche. Uh, and like this teacher is written, he's written so many books and he's on the internet. And uh, so I just want to mention that if you want to know more about him after the talk, I can refer you to some of his books. One of them in particular is called What Makes You Not a Buddhist? And and he he said those four, um, uh, he, he, he said this. He said, all compounded things are impermanence, same. And then instead of all uh, contaminated phenomena are suffering, he said, all emotions are pain. And then he said, all things have no inherent existence. And he said, nirvana is beyond concepts instead of nirvana is peace. So he wrote that when we fully realize impermanence, a generous spirit naturally arises. By generous, he did not mean to give everything you own away, but that our attachment and clinging are naturally reduced. So I, I thought that uh, it just seems like very practical and very obvious that if you realize your life is short and that tomorrow's not for sure, sure you, you, your tendency to be attached and cling is, is reduced. And I happen to know people that give everything away as well. But um, but we have to keep some back for ourselves. So he goes on to say, we cling to things as if they won't change, but change is the nature of reality. When we embrace impermanence, we prepare ourselves for big changes and are able to let go of our fear and anxiety to become more fully present to those around us, to make the most meaningful choices and to more deeply appreciate life's fleeting pleasures. Stephen King I used to read Stephen King when I was very young. I like to scare myself, I guess. Stephen King. Someone once asked Stephen King, the author of Carrie, The Shining, and other horror stories, what people are most afraid of. He didn't say serial killers or cancer or terrorists or earthquakes or hurricanes and all that sort of thing. He didn't even say death. He said that people's greatest fear is change. That change itself in all its forms is what we fear the most. Embracing change, anything that is made up of other things will eventually come apart, and there are no exceptions to this. Just because mountains or even planets outlast us does not mean they are eternal or forever. The notion that the world around us is solid and fixed is an illusion. Everything is in a state of perpetual motion and change, and this impermanence is what makes everything possible. There would be nothing new if nothing moved, and a static world would be a dead world, being mindful of the impermanence of compounded things brings us to dependent origination. Phenomena only arise due to other phenomena. Elements forever assemble, disassemble, and reassemble. There can be no separateness from everything else. Being mindful of this can help us to accept aging, loss, and death. Whether we accept them or not, they will occur. All contaminated phenomena are suffering. This is the, this is the second seal. Kensei Rinpoche replaced the second seal with all contaminated phenomena are suffering, with all emotions are pain. Some might ask, what about love? Is love pain? But he's not saying that. He meant that all conflicted emotions are pain. He meant a dualistic mind. Why is this painful? Because it's mistaken. Every dualistic mind is mistaken mind, a mind that doesn't understand the nature of things, the interconnectedness of things. Whenever there is a dualistic mind, there's hope and fear. We tend to think that hope is not painful, but actually it's a big pain. As for the pain of fear, I don't need to explain. The Buddha said, understand suffering. That's the first noble truth. We must take pain for pleasure. The pleasure we now have is actually the very cause of the pain that we're going to have sooner or later. Another Buddhist way of explaining this is to say that when a big pain becomes smaller, we call it pleasure. Mm -hmm. Contaminated here refers to actions, thoughts, and emotions which are conditioned by the three poisons, anger, greed, and ignorance. Because we see ourselves as separate from other things, we desire or are repulsed by them. The cause of suffering is craving, the craving to push things away that we don't want, and the craving to pull things to us that we want but don't have. We continue to divide the world into me versus everything else and grasp for everything thinking that it will make us happy, but all things are impermanent, and this happiness can never be lasting. The true path to happiness is learning to see what we have, what we have is enough. 
What we need is the clarity of mind to accept ourselves as we are without that nagging feeling that we're not good enough. And sorry, it's just that I'm sure some of you here would understand that our teacher is always telling, telling me this very thing. You know, you belong. So I hope anybody here that doubts that can hear that you belong, you belong. Jogim Trungpa Rinpoche says, just let it be without scheming to get pleasure and avoid pain. There's much to these teachings about flipping the normal human tendency to seek pleasure and avoid pain. It's not a wrong thing. It's just that it doesn't work. It doesn't work very well when it comes to developing into a, a mature, compassionate person. Trungpa Rinpoche said that we develop an iron heart. He said that when someone develops a true friendship with themselves, the iron heart softens into something else. It becomes a vulnerable heart, a tender heart. It becomes a genuine heart of sadness because it's a, it is a heart that's willing to be touched by pain and remain present. A week ago, I came here in the early morning and I told Rinpoche that I was very sad and I needed the support of this sacred space. He said to give my sadness a different name. He said, instead of sadness, I should think of my heart as tender. The subtle, that subtle change in language changed my inner narrative. And sadness became something not to be fixed or gotten rid of. Pema Chodron, a student of Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, wrote many books. One of them, When Things Fall Apart, is permeated with the notion of no hope, no fear. And her book, The Wisdom of No Escape, is especially dedicated to this idea. Pema says, that to undo our habitual patterns requires that we begin to turn around some of the most basic assumptions, believing in a solid, separate self, continuing to seek pleasure and avoid pain, or thinking that someone is out there is to blame for our pain. One has to get totally fed up with this way of thinking. One has to give up hope that this way of thinking will bring us peace. Suffering begins to dissolve when we can question the belief or the hope that there's, some, that there's anywhere to hide. A little further in the book, she says, hope and fear come from feeling that we lack something. This something comes from a sense of poverty. We can't simply relax with ourselves. We hold on to hope, and hope robs rib us of the present moment. Okay. You guys following? <laughs> because I, I wove together, you know, I can take no credit for these words. I can only take credit for uh, sharing them. Now I'm going to say a little bit about His Holiness the Dalai Lama. His Holiness the Dalai Lama asks, when then is Buddhism truly Buddhism? He says, um, in our tradition, we have four schools. He says, all schools agree that the four seals of the Dharma are what distinguish Buddhism from not Buddhism. If any of the four seals contradict, then the teaching cannot be considered a Buddhist teaching. It feels like I've talked so much, but when I look at the clock, it's not too bad. <laughs> so all contaminated phenomena are suffering. Contaminated here refers to actions, thoughts, and emotions, which are conditioned by the three poisons. This is from the Dalai Lama. Because we see ourselves as separate from other things, we desire or are repulsed by them. The cause of suffering is craving, the craving to push away things we have but don't want. There, I'm saying it again, but it's no harm in that. And the craving to pull us things towards us, we, things we want but don't have. So um, now I'm going on to all phenomena are empty. In the four seals, uh, it states it this way. All phenomena are selfless and empty. According to the teachings, teachings of the Buddha, it is wrong to hold the view, I have no self, and also wrong to hold the view, I have a self, because both arise out of the wrong view, I am. We must attempt to view what we call I, or being, as the combination of physical and mental aggregates, which are working together in this ever-changing moment, subject to the laws of karma. There is not and cannot be anything lasting, eternal, or without change. The doctrine of shunyata or emptiness teaches that there is neither reality nor non-reality, 
only relativity. Reflections on His Holiness teaching on emptiness at Gandan Jangse Mon Monastery. So this was uh, uh, a talk that the Dalai Lama gave in 2014. He was really forceful. This was an important talk for me because uh, I get really focused on bodhicitta. And that's it. And um, But over and over, His Holiness says, our short-term purpose is happiness in this life, but our long-term purpose is liberation, enlightenment, Buddhahood. There's no way to attain Buddhahood with a self-cherishing mind than this. He says, every time I open my mouth, I am more or less talking about emptiness. That's because I'm compelled to do so, because without the practice of emptiness, nothing works, because the only real practice that can overcome the self-cherishing mind is emptiness. If we can overcome the self-cherishing mind and the self-grasping mind through the understanding of emptiness, the graduated path of enlightenment starts to be being realized. Bodhi, bodhicitta, too, this is why I like this talk, because I keep thinking that's the whole thing, even though I, I mean, I'm like I mentioned in the beginning, I'm a beginner. Bodhicitta, too, is an unsurpassable path, but what can bodhicitta do without emptiness? The self-grasping mind boils down to our understanding of phenomena, and the only way to understand the clear nature of reality is through the understanding of emptiness. The third century, century Indian Buddhist master Nagarjuna taught, emptiness wrongly grasped is like picking up a poison snake by the wrong end. I felt like I should mention Nagarjuna. But I, because I say, quote, people... And uh, that's what I'm doing here quite a bit. It, it I, I want to assure you that I'm understanding some of it and a lot not. I know that because of how reactive of a person I am. <laughs> People go, God, hey, you just ran out of the room. What happened? I'm like, uh, you know, it's, it's just evidence of where I'm really at. But anyway, I want to keep going because I think this is important about Nagarjuna. He's, uh, the quote I just gave where he says, Emp emptiness wrongly grasp grasped is like picking up a poisonous snake by the wrong end. In other words, we will be bitten. Emptiness is not complete nothingness. That's important because uh, the translation into English where it says emptiness, at least in my case, I thought, I thought it meant em nothingness. It's been a while since I thought that, but that's what I initially thought. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean nothing exists at all. This would be a nihilistic view Contrary to common sense, what it does mean is that things do not exist the way our grasping self supposes they do. In his book on the Heart Sutra, the Dalai Lama calls emptiness the true nature of things and events. But at the same passage, he warns us to avoid the misapprehension that emptiness is an absolute reality or an independent truth. In other words, emptiness is not some kind of heaven or separate realm apart from the world and its woes. The Heart Sutra says all phenomena in their own way are empty. It doesn't say all phenomena are empty. This distinction is vital. Own being means separate, independent existence. The passage means that nothing we see or hear or are stands alone. Think of the Dalai Lama, the kind of person he is. Generous, humble, smiling, laughing. So we can see that a mere intellectual reading of emptiness fails to really uh, capture his essence. Nirvana, okay, so now the final uh, seal that I want to uh, mention, and I just say very little about it because um, the, I just say very little about it. But all of these things are available to you, too. If you want to do the research, it's all there. You can talk to Lama Jimpa, for example. Nirvana's peace is the fourth seal. Nirvana is a state beyond all dualistic conceptions. It is not right or wrong, good or bad, existing or not existing. The Buddha taught that Nirvana is beyond human imagination or understanding. That's why I felt like, what can I possibly say? and that we should focus on our daily practice instead of speculating about what nirvana is or is not. So whoever holds these seals to be true in their heart and in their mind is a Buddhist.
Thank you for listening to my talk. <laughs> so now, this is time to have comments yep. and questions only if they're super easy. <laughs> or not. It, it, you're free not to as well. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, You hold a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> huh? uh, I've got an easy one. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> That's making me uneasy just to hear it. I, uh, yeah. I'm just curious why they're called seals. Oh, you know, um, I know Mahamuch is a seal. Gosh, I, I don't know, but I'm happy if someone else knows why they're called seals. Doesn't Do you know why, Connor? Maybe if you knew a little bit, it's better than not anything at all, right? <laughs> um, it, it's not like seal like the marine mammal. It's mm -hmm. like a stamp, right? So it's sort of what oh. distinguishes different schools. So it's these are the the four seals according to Galupa uh, tradition, right? And Kagyu tradition is a little bit different, like Patty said. So it's just these are the things that distinguish us, and especially back in the day when the, the Buddhist schools were debating <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yes, those those are the seals that we're not talking about. <laughs> uh, you know, Connor, I don't want to embarrass you, but I think you might be wrong. Oh, that, oh, one, one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eli. <laughs> um, yeah, so back in the day when the Buddhist schools were really uh, debating Indian and Hindu schools, they also have their seals, right? But they're a lot different. So especially the ones about you know, um, selflessness of persons and contamination and what compounded phenomena mean, all those would be different. So there's sort of like, this is this is our school. This is the, the stamp that we are. But it could just also be a bad translation into English. Mm -hmm. Hi, I just wanted to say um, thank you for your talk. I uh, actually appreciated that you started off talking about um, why, like with the prayers and their significance. Mm -hmm. As someone who is new to coming here, mm -hmm. I'm still in that uncomfortable phase where I'm like, I don't know if I want to say this thing because I want to make sure that I actually mean it. I, I'm, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Very careful with my words. And I think like listening to you say of looking at it as a meditation. I also grew up in a Christian church. So same thing. I'm like, oh, yeah. a little bit <laughs> like, oh, mm -hmm. but um, the energy here feels safe for me. But, but I appreciate you saying that because mm -hmm. I think I'm getting to this space the more I come and listening to it and like really reading into it and saying, does this resonate with my spirit? Mm -hmm. And more and more, I feel like it does. Huh. Um, so thank you for sharing that. That's really important. And then the other part about what makes one a Buddhist, I feel like I've been, goodness, reading various Hindu Buddhist texts probably for the past eight to 10 years of my life, but never really felt like I could say, oh, I'm a Buddhist because I assume that it's a lot like other re religions. I know it's mm -hmm. not where you have to kind of do a thing and then you become a Buddhist. So I was just like, well, I can't say that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so seeing this and looking at it, I'm like, I do believe these things. And I was like, oh, so am I Buddhist? Mm -hmm. So I really appreciated this talk and I just wanted to share that. So oh. thank you so much. That's that that's really that means a lot to me because um I just just if it if it helps you feel more at home here, that's worth so much. Any other questions online? Mm -hmm. okay then um so uh we'll do dedication and then afterwards i have a few announcements and do we do announcements after dedication i think so 
yeah. Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has not arisen diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rizzi, Tenzin Jiaozhu, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish. May the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness. And may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Songkhapa, crown jewel of the Snowy Land Sages, Losang Drakpa, I make request at your holy feet. Announcements. I wrote the announcements down because uh, there was just a, quite a few. I I won't say all of them probably because that's maybe too much, but I... um. The first announcement I have is um, in August, I think, I believe in August, we're going to start a membership um, campaign. We, it's always ongoing, to be honest, but you know how these things are. If you listen to NPR, you know that they have these times where you wish they wouldn't talk about it anymore. That might be us. <laughs> but, you know, um, the reason we're bringing up in this kind of formal way is because sometimes uh, we want people to, we like, we have recovery groups here, for example. And we have expressions and sometimes people, they're actually members in a different way than those of us that come to these talks. They're, this is their home group or this is a place they like to listen to music and they come every time. So we're wanting them uh, to know we need them. We need their help. We need their help to take care of our home and to help our community. So the membership drive will start in August, but it's okay if you get a jump start. And um, those of us that can only give a little, that's perfectly great. And those of us that can carry others, that's perfectly great. So that's how we do it. Just a little, if that's, that might be a lot for you actually. And more generous, if, it's not really more generous. It's just your capacity, if it's greater, think about helping others who maybe can't do that. And then the second announcement is about um, Kongsar Rinpoche. Well, the membership, you can do that online, by the way. And the, other, the second one is about Kongsar Rinpoche. He's a... Uh, uh, Oh, you do? Oh, okay, wait. Thank you for the membership announcement. And if you would like to be involved in membership and in sharing your ideas for how we can grow, mm -hmm. um, come talk to me. And um, yeah, after this, I'm happy we're putting a little committee together. Yeah, I think Susan's doing it too. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a few people who have expressed interest. So yeah, okay. thanks. Okay, I probably should have had you guys do that. But anyway, I did it. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, we have a teacher who's coming on a, a Friday, which we want to have a good turnout, <laughs> you know? And I think, actually, you do yourself a favor if you come. He's bring, he wrote a book, and the book was inspired, I believe, by somebody. He, this teacher is in Nepal, and he has thousands of students all over the world. And he's an abbot of a big monastery, and he feeds a, he has a, a practice of feeding people. Um, it's it, He's just really dedicated to helping the poor. And he's coming on Friday, August 9th to give a talk and, and have a, his book with them. And you can get a signed copy of his book. And um, since it's a Friday, you know, we have all these other things going on, but if you could come and bring friends, that'd be so great. And you could also get a book and get it signed by him. He's very busy and he's only coming here for one night. So that's it. Kankser Rinpoche. And um, then, uh, let's see. I, I have a couple. Of oh, okay. I just wanted to see if I had any on, think, on my list because I. that's it. Okay. Now, Connor. Okay. Um, so as most of you know, I'm leaving this Thursday for Mongolia, Kala Chakra Empowerment, see uh, John Rinpoche. 
if you still want to donate, we'd greatly appreciate that. And then also we've got the Cottage Project, but I see Ellen's hand is up. So um, maybe Ellen wants to talk about the Cottage Project that we are also fundraising for. So Yes, she does. She does. I can tell. <laughs> is it my turn then? So I take that, that intro. It's my turn. Yes. yes, it's your turn. Okay. All right. Well, actually, I wanted to mention something about Conqueror and Pache's book signing. We did procure some books to have on hand for that, but we only have a certain number of them. We can get more, but I encourage you, if you're interested in attending and having a signed book, that you consider going onto Lions or website under the donation tab and picking the Kongsa Rinpoche book item. And that will pre-order mm -hmm. a book for you and we'll make sure that there's one available for you. And then we'll also know if there's lots of interest that we can order some more books ahead of time. So that would be helpful if people did that. Okay, the cottage. The cottage project is so exciting. Um, we are well on our way to funding brand new HVAC systems for the whole cottage. That means the old window air conditioners, if you've heard them running either from the inside or outside, and they go, they make a whole lot of noise and not much cold air. They will all come out and the wall heater will come out and they'll be replaced by these really efficient, they're called mini split systems. So because John Kostenbader gave us a giant endowment towards environmental improvements, we're well on our way to funding that. We also have a matching committee. So essentially what it means, we're still looking for a couple thousand dollars, but every dollar that you give to that is essentially leveraged by a factor of three. So if we can collect those extra couple thousand dollars, then we'll have enough to do a job that's like $7,500 worth and it'll get done in August. So we're super excited about that, but we still need some more money to pull it off. There's also a line item under the donation tab for that. So even if it's 10 bucks, five bucks, whatever it is, it will be very helpful. Thank you. Great talk, Patty. I really appreciated your talk too. Uh -huh. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks, Ellen. Do you know, um, uh, in the fall, we have a friend coming. Some of you might know, I was supposed to go to Ladakh, India to uh, visit a friend named Geshe Sewang Dorje, who's a friend of all of us here. And he has an orphanage there of like with 83 kids. And I, I didn't go. It's one of the saddest things. But um, he always is fundraising <laughs> for those kids. And um, he's coming here in October. I want to mention him because he's my such a good friend. And, um, you know, we're just, we just have to say it. We just have to say out loud uh, our needs so that, that we can um, work together to make this world a little better place. So. Thank you again for, uh, wait a minute. Oh, oh, do you have uh, something, Andrew? Okay. Hi, uh, uh, Dharma Dudes, men's group after Temple, for oh. those who are interested. Is that okay? Oh, that's wonderful. I, I just realized uh, I didn't advertise it. I'm advertising it now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I brought some snacks. I don't know if anybody. That's else. fantastic. Okay. Okay. All right, then. You're all released. Oh, <laughs> 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 